Transcendental Diary by His Grace Harisori Prabhu. November 75 to April 76. Prabhupada is in Sridham Mayapur. Nanda Kumar Swami has arrived from Africa and gave a depressing report on ISKCON's Africa mission. Ramananda Swami is struggling very hard, but meeting with little success. Hansa Duda Swami's two Mercedes buses finally came in from Germany via Vrindavan to considerable fanfare and interest from the devotees. Akshayananda Swami accompanied them. The Bullock Party from Hyderabad has also arrived successfully, completing a journey of some 1,500 kilometers. The beautiful, the beautiful moon rose at 6.20 p.m. Brilliant and full in the sky, it bathed the countryside in its cooling, luminescent rays, symbolizing the transcendental appearance of the Lord and the fulfillment of his mission. Prabhupada broke his fast, took his prasadam at 7.45 p.m. The grounds and temple were mobbed with pilgrims. It was virtually impossible to go down into the temple room and the narrow road to the front gate was jammed with tens of thousands of pilgrims. At one point, Prabhupada sent me out to see how many visitors had come. And he was very, very happy to hear of the large crowds. Typically, he wanted assurance that prasada was being distributed to all. So that was Gaur Day, 76. March 17, 1976. During his morning walk on the roof, Prabhupada heard a brief report of yesterday's festival. He was extremely pleased. Crowd estimates ranged up to 200,000 visitors. Prabhupada said that's why he had originally planned four buildings as well as a temple. Turning to Jaipataka Maharaj, he told his entourage of, G, of GBCs and new sannyasis, all the credit goes to Jaipataka Maharaj. Yes, he is struggling from the very beginning. Others who were in the beginning, they have all gone away. He also heartened Tamal Krishna Maharaj by declaring, next year the Chinese men must come. As he strolled around the, the per perimeter of the roof, Prabhupada switched to his favorite topic, science and the theory of chance. He said that the scientists cling to their various theories, even though they lack proofs and are constantly defeated by the superior power of God. Yashodananda and Swami offered the French philosopher Voltaire as a prime example of stubbornness. He was an atheist. When a Catholic priest came to him and asked, why don't you accept God, he refused. But at the end of his life, he became crazy, driven to consuming his own stool and urine. Prabhupada laughingly depicted the, the, the transignance of the scientists with a funny story about solar philosophy. One man declared that a piece of paper had been cut with a knife. A second said, no, it was done with scissors. 
an argument, an, an argument ensued, and the first man, being stronger, took the other to a river. There he told him, now if you don't agree that it was a knife, I shall throw you into this water. The other man continued to insist. It was scissors. So he was tossed into the river and began to drown. Still he would not concede. As he disappeared, his head emerged from beneath the surface with two fingers moving together like a pair of scissors. No, it is scissor, it is scissor. To loud laughter, Prabhupada thrust his hand into the air and wiggled his fingers in imitation, both charming and entertaining us. As he told us, this was the definition of a rascal. Even though he is losing his life, Still, he obstinately refuses to accept the superior force of God. This is a typical materialistic scientist mentality. In the late afternoon, two letters from Siddhar Swarup and Sudama Vipraswamis were delivered to Srila Prabhupada's room. They both departed abruptly on the eve of Gorpunima after a violent, unprovoked incident in which Sudama Vipra punched Charudas in the stomach as he descended the stairs, knocking him to the floor. Sudama Vipra's letter claimed that Charu is involved in a plot led by Madhubisa and Gargamuni Swamis to kill Siddha Swaru. If anything were to happen to Siddha Swaru, Sudama Vipra threatened, there would be what he called a fratricidal war and Madhubisa would be killed. Prabhupada shook his head in disgust. He didn't believe the accusation and he said Sudama Vipra was crazy. Calling him a first class gunda or thug, he instructed Pusta Krishna Maharaj to keep the letter on file as a precaution. Siddhar Swarup's letter was apologetic but agreed in principle with Sudama Vipras. Under the circumstances, he wrote, he found it impossible to remain in Mayapur. Okay, so that's March 17th. Tomorrow you can begin March 18th. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Nasta praeshu vabhadreshu Nityam bhagavata sevaya Bhagavati uttama shloke Bhagavati naishtaki So we're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, Chapter 7. Sex.
sacrifices performed by Daksha. Text number three. Rajapade Dagdas Tirshno. Rajapade Dagdas Tirshno. Babat Bajja Mukana Mukana Sira. Mitrashya Chakshu Shekshita Mitrashya Chakshu Shekshita Bhagam Swam Bhardisho Bhagha Bhagam Swam Bhardisho Bhagha Prajapate Dagda Sishno Prajapate Dagda Sishno Bhavat Vajya Mukham Shiro Mitrashya Chakshu Chikshite Mitrashya Chakshu Chikshite Bhagam Tvam Bhadisho Bhagha Bhagam Tvam Bhadisho Bhagha Prajapate Dagda Sirshno Prajapate Dagda Sirshno Bhavat Vajja Mukham Shira Rashya Chakshu Chikshita Rashya Bhagam Tvam Bhadisho Prajapati Daksha. Shaka, through the eyes, Ikshita, may see, 
Translation. Lord Shiva continued, Since the head of Daksha has already been burned to ashes, he will have the head of a goat. The demigod known as Bhaga will be able to see his share of sacrifice through the eyes of Mitra. There's no purport. We'll read text number four. Pushatu yujam anashya dadvir jagsatu pishtabu deva pratita sarvanga yama uchesanam dadu translation the demigod pusha will be able to chew only through the teeth of his disciples and if alone he will have to satisfy himself by eating dough made from chickpea flour. But the demigods who have agreed to give me my share of the sacrifice will recover from all their injuries. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The demigod Pushta became dependent on his disciples for chewing. Otherwise, he was allowed to swallow only dough made of chickpea flour. Thus, his punishment continued. He could not use his teeth for eating since he had laughed at Lord Shiva, deriding him by showing his teeth. In other words, it was not appropriate for him to have teeth, for he had use them against Lord Shiva. So, Prajapati Daksha was fond of performing ritualistic sacrifices and during such occasions he would invite all the demigods to come. However, he had a problem with Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva was his son-in-law. Lord Shiva had married Usha, huh? Uma, the daughter of Daksha. And so, Daksha expected Lord Shiva should be respectful to him and bow to him. But Lord Shiva is always meditating on the Supreme Lord. And so he did not give so much respect to Daksha. He did not disrespect him, but Lord Shiva is always meditating on the Supreme Lord. So he didn't just simply offer respect. To Daksha. And Daksha got offended by this and decided he wasn't going to offer any oblations to Lord Shiva when they performed sacrifices. So this led to the problem that Lord Shiva, he didn't want to go to the sacrifice anymore. He thought, no, you know, he's offensive. I don't want to go there. He'll just offend me. So Lord Shiva didn't go, but of course Uma wanted to go because she thought, you know, I want to be with all the other, my friends, and I want to see my father, and it's a social function, I like to take part in society, in the functions of society. So it created problems, and uh, 
The result was when Uma came there, her father ignored her, and she was and she saw her father offering sacrifice and not offering any oblations to Lord Shiva. So she decided she would give up her body, that I don't want to be connected anymore with my father. And she sat in meditation, and by power of meditational trance, the fire within her body burned her body to ashes. So when Lord Shiva heard that his wife had given up her body, then all the followers, all the associates of Lord Shiva, they all came and they fought with Daksha and um, Brihaspati and all the demigods. They fought with them all and punished them. They even to cut off the head of Daksha and burned it. So Lord Shiva is saying he is going to replace the head of Daksha with the head of a goat. So, of course, not very pleasant thing to have the head of a goat. Yeah. He, he was a, a very important person in the universe. A Prajapati. He's a big position in the universe. And then he's given the head of a goat. You know, oh, how would you feel? So certainly Daksha was also put in this very embarrassing situation. Later on, after receiving the head of a goat, later on Daksha also gave up his life. But anyway, the point is made here that Daksha was offensive. Ajamil was sinful. We know the story of Ajamil from the sixth canto. Ajamil was addicted to women and he was addicted to drinking and he did all kinds of things to get money like stealing and cheating. So he was sinful, but he was never actually offensive. But Daksha's problem was, he was actually offensive. And his offense was to Lord Shiva. So to commit an offense against the devotee of the Lord is even more serious than an offense against the Lord himself. Krishna can tolerate offenses against himself. But Lord Krishna cannot tolerate to see his devotees offended. Example is given that just as if you walk on the hot road or on the sand on, at the beach, if you go to the seaside, the beach is there, sandy beach, and the sun is very hot. So you may be able to tolerate the heat on your head, but it's unbearable on the sole of the feet. Right? Because the ground has absorbed a lot of heat from the sun. So the sand becomes very hot and it burns the sole of the feet. But you can tolerate it on your head. So in the same way, Lord Krishna or Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Lord, he can tolerate offenses against himself, but he cannot tolerate offenses against his devotees. Now Lord Shiva, he didn't mind so much. He's, Lord Shiva is dira. He, he's fixed in transcendence. He doesn't get disturbed when people offend him. So on. He can take it. He can tolerate it. But Lord Krishna does not tolerate to see his devotees offended. Lord Krishna makes arrangements to correct the situation. Just like uh, it is said, we can tolerate offenses against our own self, but we cannot stand by and watch another devotee being offended or being abused or insulted. It's the 
duty of the devotee to do something about it. You have to do something about it. If somebody's attacking a devotee, we should come and defend the devotee. The devotee himself, he may just tolerate it, but another devotee should not just stand and tolerate. He must come and defend and help that devotee. So in the same way, Lord Krishna, he's very concerned for his devotees. And when he sees that one of his devotees is offended, then he takes action. And we see this, uh, the famous example, of course, is how Durvasa Muni attacked Maharaj Ambarish. Maharaj Ambarish is a very saintly, noble person. He was not worried. But when Durvasa Muni came there and tried, became very offensive, tried to, tried to kill even Maharaj Ambarish, then the Lord sent his Sudarshan Chakra. And his Sudarshan Chakra not only destroyed the demon which Durvasa Muni had created, but it also came after Durvasa Muni. And Durvasa Muni had to run. And he ran. He went all the way up to Brahmaloka. But the Sudarshan Chakra followed him. Then he went to Kailash to, to beg Lord Shiva to protect him. But Lord Shiva couldn't help him. Durv Durvasa had to keep running. He ran after Kailash. He ran into Vaikuntha. And he thought he would be safe there. He went to Lord Vishnu and he asked him, Please protect me. Your Sudarshan Chakra is chasing me. But Lord Vishnu said, I cannot do anything. You have offended my devotee. If you want to be saved, you have to go back to the devotee and get forgiveness. So, offenses against the Vaishnava. We say, that is a maka, hati mati aparada. The mad elephant offense to offend a devotee of the Lord. Just like if the elephant comes in here, then it will do so much damage. You bring a big elephant, it will knock a tree over maybe, it will break everything, right? So elephants are like that. So the same way, if we offend a devotee, it's a very serious business and it destroys our devotion. It gives us big problems in our devotional service. Therefore, devotees are always very careful not to offend anybody. Just like every morning after Mongo Arti, we offer our obeisances to all the devotees. When Prabhupada first went to India, he brought, he brought with him many leaders temple presidents from different temples in America. Prabhupada told them, come with me, I'm going to India, you want to have a world Sankirtan party. So the devotees thought, oh great, Prabhupada wants me, I'm going to go there. And, you know, they were the temple president of some place there in America, and Prabhupada brought them to India to join his world Sankirtan party, and they were traveling in India doing programs. But there were problems because they were young, passionate, western bodied men and they were used to being in charge. They were used to telling people what to do. But they were all trying to, together, they couldn't get along with each other. They didn't like being told what to do by somebody else. And so there were so many problems, so many arguments, passion, different bad feelings were created among the devotees. So Prabhupada understood the situation and he told the devotees, every morning after Mongol Arte, we must all offer obeisances to 
each other. And that will nullify any of our offenses which we have committed against the devotees. Very important to take part in that little program every morning offering obeisances to all the devotees. It's very important for us because we don't know when we've been offensive or what we've done wrong. We may have offended somebody by chance. We have to protect ourselves. And the way to protect ourselves is by getting the blessings of a devotee. Generally, devotees don't curse. Right? I was telling last night about Daksha cursing Lord Shiva. But Lord Shiva didn't curse him back. And similarly, when Maharaj Parikshit was cursed, he didn't curse back. He accepted it. Similarly, when Maharaj Chitraketu was cursed by Mother Parvati, he accepted it. He didn't curse back. Because a devotee's duty, a devotee's business is to give blessings. Devotees are compassionate for the fallen souls. We're not nasty to them. We're not envious of them. We don't curse them. We bless them. Right? People come to get blessings. How to bless? What blessings should we give? That is described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, how a devotee blesses someone. We simply say, Krishna Vashtu. May your mind always be on Lord Krishna. Got it? Krishna Matir Vashtu. May your mind always be on Lord Krishna. That is the real blessing. We want to give that kind of blessing to everyone. Why they don't open the door? Open. Open. So, devotees like to give blessings. We don't curse people. We're compassionate. We show compassion on people. People may curse us. We accept it. Okay. I'm a rascal, I'm fallen, I'm a nonsense. Devotee accepts, I've done something wrong, I've offended you, I accept your curse. But a devotee does not give cursing back. So here we see uh, Lord Shiva, he's describing the reactions which these different people who all offended Lord Shiva is describing what will happen to them, the result of their action. Very serious to offend a great devotee. Right? As it said, uh, Aradhanam Sarvesham Vishnor Aradhanam Param. Of all kinds of worship, the worship of Vishnu is the best, is supreme. Aradhanam sarvesham Vishnu aradhanam param tasmat parataram devi padiyanam samacharam. Even better than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of those things in relation to Vishnu. Well, even greater than the worship of Vishnu is the worship of Tulsi Maharani, the worship of Vaishnavas, like Srila Prabhupada and Lord Shiva. By the blessing of Lord Shiva, you can get the mercy of Krishna. So, it's a great uh, misfortune that Dakshan committed such a Foolish, done such a foolish thing in offending Lord Shiva and he evoked the anger of Lord Shiva which came in this way
Okay, any questions? Yes. Well, it's a benefit for the goat, right? The goat's getting a human body. The, the goat was sacrificed. It was, you know, they were doing sacrifice, they were doing yabya, so the goat was there for sacrifice. So the head of the goat had already been taken off. So they used it, they put it on the you know, because Daksha's head had been burned to ashes, so they couldn't do anything with that. But they took the head of the goat, because they off-sacrificed the goat, so they took that head of the goat and they put that on Daksha. And gave them that and brought it back to life. They could do these kind of things. They had these kind of powers. People died, they could bring them back to life. Just like Bali Maharaj, he'd been killed. But Sukracharya, brought him back to life. And so and these great sages, great yogis and, and mystics, they had these kind of powers. Somebody was killed, they died untimely by the mantra or something, they could bring them back to life. People understood what is the body, that the body is only a dress. So they were not attached to the body. Just like Dadichi. Dadichi gave up his body because Indra came and asked him for his bones. Why? Right? Indra wanted to fight Vritasura and he asked Lord Vishnu. He, wanted, he thought Lord Vishnu would help him, would kill him. But Lord Vishnu said, no, I'm not going to kill him. You kill him yourself. And he told him, you can get the bones from the Dichi and make a thunderbolt, then you can kill Vritasura. So Indra had to go and beg the Dichi to give the bones from his body. And the Dichi, you know, the Dichi Ashram, have you been there? It's, it's just near Naimisharanya. This year I was on tour, we went to visit different holy places, and we went to Naimisharanya, and just on the outskirts of Naimisharanya, they have this Dadichi Muni temple, the place where he had actually lived and where he gave up his body. Interesting. You know, Dadichi was very renounced. So when Indra came to him, at first he said, well, don't you know the body is the thing we're most attached to? Actually, he was very renounced, but he wanted to test, he wanted to hear what Indra would say. So Dadichi said, Dadichi was saying, the body is what we're most attached to. But Lord Indra told Dadichi, he said, well, you know, it's, it's not easy to ask for charity. You have to understand, it's not easy sometimes to ask for charity. And sometimes it's not easy to give charity. For some people, it's easy to give charity. And some people, it's not. And so, for some people, it's easy to ask for charity. But for some people, it's not so easy. Depends what you're asking for, right? You're asking somebody for the bones of their body. You know, that's quite a big thing to ask for someone. Can you give the bones from your body, please? And the teaching at this temple anyway, which is there, near Nanushara, they have the, 
They have a shrine to his wife. <laughs> like that, so it appears he was in the family, he was a grihasta, but still he was so renounced that he gave up his body and Indra took the bones and made his thunderbolt weapon and used it to kill people. So, everything has its use. They were saying, the example was given here that because these people had not, because they used, they used their teeth to offend Lord Shiva, so their teeth were not out. And because they used it by their eyes, by their look, they had offended Lord Shiva, they lost their sight. And Daksha, because his, oh, his whole mind was offensive to Lord Shiva, his head was cut off. So we have to understand to use everything in the proper way. Ultimately, this body belongs to Krishna. It's given to us by the grace of Lord Krishna. We have to use it in his service, to serve him and to serve his devotees. Now Lord Shiva is the confidential associate of the Supreme Lord. He's a great devotee. Lord Krishna respects Lord Shiva. Sometimes we see Lord Shiva and Vishnu. There's this Hari Harshetra in Mayapur Dham, the combined form of Vishnu and Shiva. Lord Shiva is so intimate that Lord Vishnu and him, they accept, the, they become combined together in one form. So Lord Shiva is a very glorious devotee. And he takes the Ganga on his head. So, such an exalted soul. And he drank the poison from the ocean of, to, 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 so that they could produce the nectar from the milk ocean. He drank the halaha. He drank that poison from the ocean. And because he drank it, his throat went all blue. And that's why he wears the crescent moon on his head. Because the poison, you know, you have poison, it heats, you have a fever, it puts a lot of heat in the body. So he wears the crescent moon on his head. It was given to him to cool his body. So Lord Shiva is such a great soul, so compassionate, and Daksha offended him. What a rascal. So he got punished. All the associates of Lord Shiva, they could not tolerate to see Lord Shiva offended. And they cut off his head. So Lord Shiva was, he said, anyway, his head's all born to ashes now, can't do anything. Can't. We'll give him the head of the goat. Because the goat's head was there. So they put that head, goat's head on his body. But the point is, if we don't use everything in the proper way, then we get punished, we get reactions. The devotee themselves don't take action, but Lord Krishna cannot tolerate. Lord Krishna sent the Sudarshan Chakra after Durvasa Muni. And Durvasa Muni came to Vishnu, Lord Vishnu said, you have to go to my devotee and get relief from your offense. Then only you can be saved. So the devotee is even more powerful than the Lord. This is surprising. Hanuman jumped across the ocean to Lanka. Lord Rama had to build a bridge. Devotees are more powerful than the Lord. The Lord can give pure devotion only rarely. But the pure devotees, they give it freely. Lord Krishna doesn't give pure 
pure devotion so easily. But the, the, the pure devotees, they get it. So who's more powerful? Krishna or Krishna's devotee? Krishna gives the power to his devotees. He empowers the devotees. They get that, that potency, they get that power from the Lord himself. He gives it to the devotees. Okay, any other question? Comment? Okay, Sriman Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Timanandi.